Hey internet, I'm Simon Squibb, your host at the Good Luck Club. I believe luck is an ingredient that's necessary for a successful life. Whatever you're starting, building or shipping, I'm here to tell you, without luck, you're not going to make it. I've been testing my luck as an entrepreneur since I was 15 years old. I've had plenty of failures and successes, and I'm fascinated by the things I couldn't control. The moments that made my career and the ones that threatened to end it. In each episode, I'll invite a guest to share their stories about luck, the good and bad, and together we'll test my theory about luck's role. Welcome, Malcolm. Hey, Simon. Good to be on the show. Thanks so much for coming on. Listen, I always like to start the podcast by asking our guests this simple question. What does success mean to you? Um, yeah, well, I, 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 was, I was looking at the questions in advance and it, it's quite interesting because I think the answer is different depending on the stage of business that you're at or, or the stage of, 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 of where you're coming into this. So when you start off as an entrepreneur, um, I think the definition of success for a lot of people tends to be based around um, sort of financial remuneration or success on a spreadsheet. Um, and I think for me personally, as I developed as an entrepreneur, my definition of success sort of evolved. And um, the, mid, the, the, the midpoint for me um, was um, looking at being able to look after a better team as opposed to making a lot of money. Um, and so for me, the team welfare became sort of my definition of success. Um, in my later sort of business um, cycle, it, it, it was about the social impact that the business was having and being able to feel good about what we were doing as a business and organization. So, yeah, I don't think it's, 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 it's just any one answer for, for, for any, any person. I think it sort of evolves as time evolves. When did the social piece kick in for you because I think that's true I mean I know for myself when I started my own first business which was a gardening company social impact was I didn't even know what that meant or how did it how did it end up in your um, mind how did that happen I, I mean it was just kind of a natural progression so um, you know you you, you you get to a certain point where you're financially able to look after yourself your business is doing well then you you, you want to look after the team Make sure you, you, you've got sort of a happy team. A happy team means that your business is going to be happy. It's going to be a, a community um, that you are wanting to wake up to every day and go to work. And it's a, it's a good environment to be in. Um, and I think that's really important for creating a successful business. Um, when, you, um, when you start getting to that point, you start looking further afield. Um, for, for us in, in F&B, um, we started looking at um, the social impact of what we were doing in terms of, you know, in the environment, um, animal, animal welfare, educating people on um, food waste and things like that. Um, the problem with a lot of those things is they cost money. Um, so, you know, eliminating single-use plastic from the front of house in your restaurant means that you buying alternatives that are more expensive. Um, so your, your definition of success needs to change from being a financial um, definition to, to, to something which is more feel good. Um, and I, I, I think there's, there's motivations to make those changes because I think if you pass that feel good factor onto your con the, con the, the consumer or the customer, they'll buy into that feel good factor and they'll feel good about uh, contributing towards your business. So I, I think there's a lot of benefits to to doing that. Do you find that people do respond well to the social side? I find sometimes it gets overlooked if if it makes the experience any better, perhaps people notice it, but if they don't really feel like it makes any difference to their experience in an F&B context, do you think people do appreciate it? Um, I, I It's been interesting because I it's we've been trying to do this now for the last eight years. Initially, not many people cared. And I think it's, it's, it's really good to see that the consumer is more educated today. They demand it more from businesses. Um, however, the, sh the social impact that a business can take um, means that you have the luxury of, of, of having a good and successful business in the first place. If you, don't have, if you have the financial constraints, you might not go and eliminate single-use plastics and buy more expensive um, uh, 
um, products. And, and, and that's why I say, I, I say the definition of, of, of success must change for an entrepreneur, depending on how successful they are, or what stage of the business cycle they're in. I want to jump back to something you said as well about a happy team. I mean, I've personally had lots of teams and making everybody happy is, is never easy. How, how do you achieve that? Well, I mean, we, we, there's a saying in, in, in F and B: if the team's happy, the customer's happy. Um, so all of our all of our um, training manuals is about looking after the team first. It's about their well being. It's about giving them knowledge, empowering them. Um, you know, look, you know, spending spending time with the team, team building, um, staff dinners, socializing together, and building that sense of team spirit. Um, and you know, F, F, the F and B business, restaurants, it's it's much it's it, it's much like a a game of football. You've you've got your team players. The lights go on at six p.m. and it's showtime. Um, and so, if the team's not motivated, you know, doing high fives, ready to tackle service, they're not feeling empowered. They're feeling upset. You're not going to get. You're not going to give the customer a good good experience. Um, and so, it's even more important in my industry um, that you've got um, this sense of sense of team and and unity was there a particular interview technique i mean uh, you to find whether these people would fit within your culture or did you train them up to fit within your culture how, how did you how did you achieve that um i mean a lot of it comes down to personality you've got to see if you gel gel with them if you think um they're going to gel with other people um and our interviews tend to be a little bit less technical uh, a little bit less experience based. Um, obviously, experience um, it is something that is crucial, but it's more conversational. It's to see if you're going to get on with someone, see if they'll be able to get on with customers, get on with other team members. Um, and I, I, for me, that that's you know a lot more crucial than how many years you've done in in the industry and where you've worked. Just thinking about listeners out there that are hiring today and trying to build a culture that you're talking about, and what what tip you give them. And when trying to uh, make their their staff happy, I mean, is it? Do you think the social impact piece? But going back to that, do you think that aligns everyone? If you've got the same moral code, for example, do you think that comes into play? Yeah, I mean, you 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 you're looking for like minded people. Um, a, a, a team is a, a group of like minded individuals that get along, um, but you've also got to be inspired by each other. And I I I, I I've I've always told myself that you're not going to learn anything if you're not around people that inspire you every day. Um, and, and that goes for the leaders. They have to be learning from their own team as well, adapting and constantly changing their viewpoint. If you think you know it all and you tell your team what to do, they'll eventually not listen to you. Um, that, that, that to me is not being a leader. Um, so yeah, just my, my advice would be make sure you, you inspire your team and you get inspired by them as well. In your business, do you feel like you had a big break? How how did you make it successful? What what was the process? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess this comes down to luck, yeah. And I was thinking about what my definition of luck um, in business is. Um, there's 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 a saying that my mom always says to me, which is, if you're going to find a horse, it's easier to ride a horse. Um, and she always said that you make your own luck. And those were the two things that she gave me as sort of business advice. And, you know, I, for, for me, I think luck is timing. If, if you have the right idea, but you have, um, you have the wrong timing, that to me is bad luck. Um, so the more important thing to me is persistence. If you believe that that idea was correct, but you had bad luck, bad timing, and you go back at it again and you're successful, the persistence is the, the, the answer to success. It's not the bad luck. Um, and if you keep throwing enough mud at the wall, as long as you think that idea is good, you're eventually going to be successful. Um, and I, I, I think you probably understand that more than anyone when you're, when you're spread betting on, on, on different um, startup businesses you know, you're going to expect some failures. But if you make the right decisions, you're persistent about your investment, um, 
you'll eventually be successful and you'll be successful more than 50% of the time. And that's what investors try to do when they're, when they're, when they're putting money down. I think persistence is a great word. I, I do sometimes notice that some people carry on, they take persistence the wrong way. Basically, they'll carry on with what they're doing, even though it's not working, thinking that if they're persistent, it will eventually work. But what do you think about the concept of pivoting, for example? Have you had to do that in your businesses? Maybe you had a concept for a, bit, a restaurant, for example, and when you've actually opened it, you've realized it's not what customers want and you've changed? Or how do you perceive persistence? Yeah. So, I mean, as I said, you, you, you have to have the belief that that idea is going to be successful. So if you've had bad luck, which, which, in, which, in, which for me is about probability, it's about timing, it's, it's not really about the fact that there's this sort of my, mystical thing called luck. Um, so, it's, you know, say, say you're in Hong Kong and you try to open up a business in the last 12 months, which hasn't been a great e economy, but you believe that if you waited another six months and, and the economy turned for the better, then, then you're good. But as you said, you have to learn when things aren't going right. And you have to learn from your mistakes. And I, I you know, that would be my biggest takeaway um, to, to people is that you've got to know when things aren't working and to give up. Um, there's, there's been a few moments where I've, I've done, I've, 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 I've opened up a restaurant or I've had a business idea where I've just been too persistent to try to make it work and it's continued to lose money and I probably should have thrown in the towel two or three months earlier. Um, and, you know, that's the, a, a lot of it comes down to pride and, and wanting something to work and, and, and hoping for the best when, when really deep down you should, you, you know, you should have made a business call to, to, to have given up by then. Isn't that a really difficult balance between the word persistence and, you know, knowing when to give up? What is that line? Is it any advice given your experience? Is it is it an ego thing? Like, so yeah. just check your ego, like you said, or, or is it more? Is it a financial weight that makes you realize what, what do you think is that trigger? I mean, it, it, again, it's very complicated. It depends at, at, at what size your business is. Is it a component of your business that you're risking? Is a couple of months not going to hurt you in terms of your cash flow? Um, if it's your startup business and you've spent all of your money, I mean, you're being forced to you're being forced to to give up. If you go back and raise money for the same bad idea and you go back out there and lose that, then I mean, you know, you, it, it's 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 a very complicated thing, as you said. I think I think um, it's you gain that from experience. You know, you, you learn when to be persistent, you learn when to give up. And I think you just have to make your own mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think that's been my biggest lesson is, is, is learning, learning the mistakes, taking the best moments from those mistakes and making yourself stronger and a better person moving mm -hmm. forward. Um, and that, that evolution is, is key to any entrepreneur. I think that's good advice. I think the learnings is another area that's fascinating to me. I think you can take the wrong learnings from a failure. So you might open up a restaurant and, and say, well, I opened up a restaurant, but it didn't work. Don't get into the restaurant business. So the lesson was the wrong lesson. The lesson is open up a restaurant that people actually want to go to or create an environment that people actually want to go to. Right? But a lot of people to take the wrong lessons. So how do you make sure you're taking the right lessons from, from failure? Um. I mean, yeah, I, look, I think, I think when you've, as an entrepreneur, when you set up your first business, if you pour your heart into that business and it's not successful, you take it personally. Mm. Um, and I think, I think what I've learned um, as an entrepreneur is that you can't take things personally. When it comes down to business, if it hasn't worked, you have to stand back up, get on your two feet, put your ego to the side, try again or try something else. Um, if you start to get emotional about it, personal, that, you know, I, I, I really tried my hardest. It, it didn't work. It, the world's against me. I'm unlucky. That's the wrong mindset. And that's when you need to switch into a persistent mindset. Um, when you're persistent and you keep hitting a wall and you keep going at it and you keep losing money, that's when maybe you should take time to reflect on your decisions and go back to the drawing board and see, you know, tweak the financial model, look at the business plan and see what's not working. Um, I, I think if you do this long enough and you have the right ideas and you're willing to adapt your ideas, and adaptation is probably another uh, key lesson for entrepreneurs, 
one idea doesn't on paper even if you've raised money for it does not necessarily mean it's going to be successful just because you raised the capital for that idea you have to continue to develop your business plan you have to continue to learn and see how it unfolds and i i think that's a, that's that's you know that's that's also been a, a big lesson for me over over the years it's interesting your take on luck as well i i think it's a fascinating area that's why i'm focusing in on it but i do think entrepreneurs we think and I think this way too, that you can influence luck. But there's an interesting argument around things that are out of your control. So for example, the coronavirus. I mean, that must be hitting your F&B businesses quite hard right now. So that's out of your yeah. control. That is just bad luck. So how, how, do you, how do you manage that sort of out of your control bad luck? Yeah, well, so look, I mean, every business has an up and down and every financial economy has a cycle. And you've got to be equally as good as handling down cycles as you can up cycles. Um, and so you can't just sit back when the economy is going down and go, all right, I'm losing money. I'm having to close restaurants. I'm not getting any customers. I've had bad luck. And again, it's mindset. Now it's like, OK, right, I need to be proactive. I need to look at what I can do to minimize this. I need to look at how I can inspire um, my customers to come to the restaurant, show them our hygiene measures, come up with new marketing ideas. Um, and that's the adaptation part of being an entrepreneur. You've really got to adapt yourself to every situation and you've got to change. You know, today's situation isn't going to be tomorrow's situation. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a moving, it's, it's a moving wheel and it's, every day is a new game. Did you have a big break in business? Do you, do you see... An actual moment is there a story there yeah so um the it, and and it's kind of this relationship between luck which i'm like i'm i'm, I'm of your opinion if, if you've got the right mindset you create more opportunities to be lucky and and that's really what i was taught you if if you don't have the right mindset you don't produce those opportunities and then the other side of that is gambling so it's taking bigger um risks or taking risks at the right moment, which requires a little bit of timing and luck uh, to work in your favor. So for me, it was Mot32. Um, Mot32 was, you know, th three or four times um, bigger investment than we'd ever put into a restaurant. It was a huge space. It was in Central. It was Asian food, uh, which wasn't currently in our portfolio. And we were doing, we were doing this um, cuisine, uh, Chinese cuisine for a Chinese market. Um, so it was, it was, it felt very risky um, to me, but that was really the moment where we kind of just doubled down what we were doing as a business. Um, we took the risk and it paid off. Best restaurant in Hong Kong, if you ask me. It's one Thank of, you. Makes me want to move back, but luckily you're opening up all over the world now. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. No, we've got, uh, we've got seven new projects around the world and uh, we're in five different locations currently. So. Well, that's another area I, I think for entrepreneurs listening out there, you always hear this kind of concept of focus, you know, do one thing well. But when you've got one business, which you know, is maybe maximum concepts in your case, but you've got multiple businesses within that business, how do you manage all that? Um, so I, I, again, I think it's part of the business cycle. I think you get, you get to a point where you think um, as an uh, as a you know a younger version of me, um, and I know one of your questions that you want to end on. And my advice to myself five years ago would have been exactly what you just said, which is focus on less things and do it better. Um, and that's what I'm doing today. Um, but five years ago, we had 22 different concepts, 22 different cuisine types. Uh, and we're expanding different things around the world. And, you know, when you hit a bad economy spot, if you're not focused, your business will shrink um, quite rapidly because you won't be able to maintain all of the all of that stress and all of that pressure and all of those different changes that you, you have to adapt to. So, yeah, I, I mean, for, for me, focus doing a few things really well and within your um, uh, capacity is, is super important. I get a lot of listeners uh, reaching out to me talking about how they want to start a business, but they don't have money. And so what's your view on this money business thing? Do you, do you, I mean, my view is that you can start a business without money. Of course, you can start a business with money. But what, what's your view? How did you start your business and what's your view? 
Um, I, th- I think Simon, as you as you know, raising raising money is 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 what a lot of people come out of university thinking is this mythical thing that they don't understand. You don't get taught it at school, um, but with the right idea, the right presentation, and the right contacts, it can it can be quite an easy part of the business. For me, executing is harder than raising money. Um, so, you know, we've raised a lot of money over the last 10 years with different businesses, different business ideas, but the execution for me is, is much more complicated. It's to see through your business plan to the end. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would say to, to young entrepreneurs, like you shouldn't be afraid to try to raise money, go out, get some advice from people who've done it before, work out how it's done. Um, there's a lot of people out there willing to invest in small startups and help you, whether it's your family members, your parents, friends. Um, as you said, I think it's always I, I, I think it's always possible to raise money. If you were starting again today, do, do you do you think you'd raise more money, raise less money, have more investors, have less investors? Do you have any advice on that front? I, I think I think you. <laughs> I think you want to keep things as simple as possible. So I don't, I don't think having a large group of investors is necessarily good for you unless it's a strategic uh, move for the business, uh, like a membership club, for example, where you want lots of people coming into the club. Um, but I think, I, I think simplicity is key. And I think as you develop your, your, your business and you, 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 you grow your business, the more simple you can th- keep things, the more efficient, the more streamlined, the easier you can get from point A to point B, um, you'll, it, it'll, it'll show massively to your stress levels and, and your ability to be able to process a lot of information further down the line. So, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's also a very important factor. How do you manage your stress out of interest? Um, I mean, yeah, so we've, we've got, you know... We've got eight different businesses now, and within each of those businesses, we've got quite a quite a few different subsidiaries. And, and you know, Maximal Concept has restaurants around the world. So, for 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 me, organization, efficiency, and sim- simplicity is is paramount to everything I do. Um, and it's being consistent as well. You know, business is about communicating well to people. Um, and staying on top of things. And, and if it's a complicated mess and you're not able to keep on top of it, you will lose control of that business. But I don't think I've ever seen you actually stressed. So how, how I'm, I'm interested in how you manage it because you've got so many moving parts and such a big organization, but you're always smiling and you always look relaxed. What is the secret? Um, there's, so there's, there's moments of my day where I say to myself, these are the two hours you need to be relaxed. There's moments of my day where I say, right, it's guns, guns out. Let's get as much work done as possible, and let's run. Um, and it's really compartmentalizing. So you know, if if you're running multiple businesses, you can't do them all at the same time. So these this two hour block, we're doing this, and that's all we're doing. And we're not going to get distracted by anything else, and we're going to get it done. And then once we've got that done, we'll move on to the next thing. And stress comes when you're thinking about too many things that you can't handle. And if you can't compartmentalize stress, so if you're having a bad day at home and you bring that stress into the office, you haven't compartmentalized. If you go into the office, having gone, okay, right, I have some stress at home, I'm going to leave it there and then just look at this with a fresh new pair of eyes, that stress doesn't transfer from one to one division to another division. So I, th- I think, again, it's mindset. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm like everyone else, I get stressed. Um, I lose control of, of, of things, you know, th- things spin out of control um, and you've just got to adapt and you've got to keep yourself motivated and you've got to keep your team motivated. Do you... I, I'm sure for the world right now, um, it's, it's, it's a stressful time for most people. Are, are, you, so... are you worried about the coronavirus from, like, do you see it as SARS and it will blow over or, or is, it, is this more serious? Um, my, my bet is, it, I mean, it's definitely more serious than SARS. Um, how, how the Western world is going to handle it in the coming months is, is definitely going to be an, an interesting, an interesting period of time in terms of business. Um, and you know, we're, we've just got to keep our eyes open and, 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 and stay positive and, 
and keep adapting to um, the new challenges that come out of this. Oh, it's it's how I'm, I'm assuming it's affected your businesses quite dramatically. But do, how do you insulate yourself from that? You 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 can't. Um, and if I mean if things aren't working, you've got to you've you've got to come up with ideas to make them work. You've you know there's there's a lot of problems in in, in Hong Kong. You, you, we, we've we've got these skyrocketing rents, and we've got this economy where. People aren't going out. They're not socializing like they were were before. Um, and there's just you've got to think outside of the uh, you know outside of the box right now. Um, we're being creative with um, our landlords. We're working together with um, with people that you know um, that we wouldn't have normally worked with, and we're coming up with deals that that um, we wouldn't have thought of before. Um, and all of those ideas that we generate help keep the business afloat through the bad times. Um, and, you know, we've asked the team to help as well. And I, th- I think that's important. I think if you've given, um, if you've given a lot to your team and you say, guys, you know, this is a period of time where everyone's struggling and we need your help, they're not going to help you if you never looked after them in the first place. And so I, it, it really comes back to if you're going to weather the storm, weather the storm with people that, um, that um, you you want to be with long term, and and continue to grow grow the business when when that storm passes. So I think it's uh, another good lesson for anyone listening out there about investing in your people. I think to me it reminds me of kind of like being on a boat, and if you don't uh, feed your staff well on that boat, and then one day you've run out of food, if everyone's not already well fed, you're not going to get to the finish line in the next few days. Everyone's going to die before you get there. So it's basically looking after yeah. your people, and I think it's something people overlook. I, I, as you're building a business, yeah. sometimes you're so busy. If you're in the service business like you are, and I, I've been in the service business too, you're so busy looking after customers, there is a yeah. tendency to overlook the people that are looking after your customers. You spend so much yeah. time trying to make the customers happy that you forget. So it's uh, it's, yeah. it's a good reminder for people out there to, to look after your people. Um, and, you know, you're, I, I always say uh, to my crew here that, you know, we, we, you're not working for me. We're, we're working together. We're a partnership. But it's so many people forget that, right? I think sometimes they see it as you're working for me, do this, and, and I'll get whatever I can out of you until you know the next person comes along. It's a big mistake. Yeah, yeah. You know what? And I, I, I actually that's good advice as well. I, I think it is is when you're coming up with your business, everyone's so focused on the returns they can make mm-hmm. that they're not focused on how much investment is going to be required for the team building aspect from it. So I, you know, I, I, again, I think investing in the team. What you just said is. That's also key, you know, and, and if people could look at that slightly earlier rather than it's the second thing that you come to after you're successful, you'd probably get a better chance of becoming successful because hmm. you, you'd be building a better team in the, in the first place. Hmm. So true. Yeah. Do you think being an adventure athlete has, has helped you be a better entrepreneur? Do you think there's a parallel between the two worlds? Yes. Um, a lot of people say that it's um it's still um, thrill seeking it's you know chasing adrenaline um but it isn't it for doing extreme sports is all about managing risk it's about assessing the situation and it's about being adaptive um to that and if you know you pay the highest consequence in extreme sports if you get it wrong and and, and you pay it with your life um and so it's it's really about precision and I think, you know, precision in business is key to, to su- being successful as well. Um, and compartmentalizing stress. Because if you can't compartmentalize stress when you're hanging to a wall at 6,000 meters, freezing at minus 20, you're not going to be able to get yourself out of a situation. And so being able to put your fears, your stress aside and deal with the situation, it, I, I find it good training. Um, and it's, it's kind of a weird thing to say, but I, I, I think one trains the other. Totally. Um, and they are definitely related. Wonderful. Well, look, um, we're going to jump over to YouTube now and do a Q&A with you. So I've got some great questions from our audience that want to ask you directly questions. So we're going to jump over to YouTube and do that now. But I just want to wrap up the podcast, which is 30 minutes, so people listen to it on their way to work. So thank you so much, Malcolm. I'm going to sum up what, what I've heard from you as the quick takeaways. Team welfare, folks. I think that's a very important thing to to focus on more. If you're not focusing on it at the beginning of your business, make sure you're focusing on it right now. I love the story Malcolm gave about uh, his advice from his mother, which is ride a horse to find a horse, which is pretty interesting thinking about that. It's much easier to find that horse. Um, Know when to give up 
I think that's a, a tricky path to tread when you link it to persistence, but something to truly uh, get your head around and, and maybe consider. And I like the final point, which is stress comes when you're doing too many things. So uh, I agree with that totally. And, and that's why um, um, I, I personally am doing one thing right now in this podcast and trying to do it well. So Malcolm, thank you so much. We'll jump over to YouTube now and, and do the Q&A. But thank you very much for being our podcast guest today. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate it.